In this lecture, we're going to get started talking about ethnography. This is just a primer. We're going to cover this in more depth in the upcoming lectures, the tutorials, and the readings that are available on the Moodle site. Let's start with the basics. So the word ethnography comes from the Greek ethnos, meaning people or folk, while graphos means I write. Thus, ethnography means I write about people. Ethnography is a form of qualitative research, which focuses on people and places. It involves unstructured, subjective description of data. Quantitative research focuses more on numerical data and statistics. It is typically more structured and objective in its approach. Ethnography is usually taught in ways that imagine students will become formal researchers. But that is not the strict goal here. Instead, I want to use this subject as an opportunity for you to build a specialization in a media, text, or context that is relevant to your professional aspirations. And I want to help you come to an understanding of how qualitative research methods, practices, and approaches can be useful for you in your future careers in the communication and media landscape, specifically the creative industries. Qualitative inquiry seeks to discover and to describe narratively what people do in their everyday lives and what their actions mean to them. It identifies meaning-relevant kinds of things in the world, kinds of people, kinds of actions, kinds of beliefs and interests. In focusing on the difference in the form of things that make a difference for meaning. This is a quote from uh, Frederick Erickson in the uh, Sage Handbook of Qualitative Research. So, Qualitative research is about the telling of stories of different kinds of people and different kinds of things. And ethnography involves a set of processes for collecting data, a processes for analyzing data, and theories or paradigms for interpreting data. The purpose of ethnography is to assist others to better understand the lives, perspectives, rationales, and experiences of people and objects from their point of view. As ethnographers, you will learn how to search, discover, and locate information, observe, listen, and participate in events, experiences, and situations. You will write, record, map, and document. Then you will think, reflect, and narrativize in order to communicate, report, and mediate. From the outside, it is easy to fall into the trap of thinking that the creative industries, particularly marketing and advertising, and the more traditional sectors of media and communication like publishing, film, and television, are dominated by knowledge gained from quantitative approaches. Ratings, sales, demographics, and of course now social media fueled big data analytics, impressions, statistical understandings, psychographics, and algorithmic analysis are all massively important to these industries. It, and it would seem from the outside that, that the creative industries are almost entirely driven by this information. However, in order to compete with the increasing complex network of relations, between producers, distributors, investors, advertisers, and audiences, it takes a, a more specialized kind of knowledge and a specialized kind of insight and creativity that comes from that knowledge and insight that can only be gained via ethnographic methods. Qualitative research generally, and ethnography specifically, offer a range of methods to better understand the nuances of audiences and producers from their experiences and their perspectives. It's the difference between knowing that someone is watching the latest Netflix series 
or the, that Netflix show is playing on some television in the background somewhere, right? You can get that from the Netflix data. But what you can't get from that data is a sense of how that Netflix show or that Netflix series becomes part of the televisual experience of people in their everyday lives. You can sometimes get impressions and, and uh, you know, raw data about the number of times it's mentioned or whether it's trending. But unless you actually look at what's being said about that um, show, you can't really understand how it's being integrated into people's lives. Sure, you might know what a person watches at what time of day, and for how long, you might know how many times it's mentioned on Facebook. But unless you ask or observe or participate and think about what's going on and talk to people about what's going on, you're not going to understand why. And that is the function of ethnography. Ethnography helps you to get to the texture of everyday life to better understand the nuance of experience. And it's that kind of knowledge that can give you a competitive advantage. It's also a way of including audiences or sectors of audiences that might have been left out previously um, for, for whatever reason. And so it's a way that you can build an audience. You can build a community of people who are actively engaged and interested in the content that you're producing. I'm deliberately framing ethnography and qualitative research this way as a means to connect to your future career, but also to give you a sense of how ethnography has been used in the past to advance the understanding of marginalized, disenfranchised, underrepresented people with a diverse range of cultural, social, historical, and geographical backgrounds. The readings each week will help with this approach. It's also important to point out that media ethnography is not really interested in the text itself. We're not really interested in the show or in the podcast or in uh, the image, at least not directly. What we're more interested in is the context of which that content is relevant. We're much more interested in the locations that people are accessing this text and the types of technologies, platforms, spaces that they are using to access the text. We're more interested in the geography of where these people are from and the cultures that they're a part of. We're more interested in the cost and how this fits into everyday budgets or different wage brackets, things like that. We're interested in the in in um, the not so much the the temporal uh, understanding in terms of like the times that people are, are watching or how for you know for how long, for example, someone is watching during the day, but rather how that time fits in the whole experience of the day. For example, playing mobile games uh, on your phone. We're not really interested in, in how long people play those games for, but at what times of the day and, and at what events in their lives are they playing that game? Like, are they playing it when they're, when they're waiting in line uh, for a coffee? Are they playing it while, um, you know, waiting to pick up the kids after school, right? It's, it's, it's more about how the, the, the temporal topography of their lives is accommodating or being accommodated by the text. And of course, location, you know, not just geographic location, but domestic location, you know, are, are people watching television on the couch anymore? Or is it more like probably your experience where you're watching TV uh, on a laptop at your desk while studying? So I'm going to start talking about the methods of ethnography. There's a huge range of methods. Most of what we're going to talk, be talking about is, is field research. 
that is uh, gaining an experience of the topic or problem that you're investigating by being in the field. And we'll, we'll talk more about what the field actually is. It's not really a physical space. It's more of a kind of conceptual space. And when you're in the field and, and doing field research, you're largely doing observation studies. And there are two kind of major ones. One where you're just kind of observing what's going on and you're kind of set back from it. And the other is participant observation, where you're actually engaging in something, whether it's um, you know following a particular um, uh, influencer or playing a particular video game and you're taking notes and your observations are framed by your participation. Interview is a very common method. And of course that involves survey and, and, and focus groups. There are other forms of, of method and data collection that we'll talk about. And, and some of those have to do with different uh, senses like visual senses, taste, sound, and we'll, we'll get more into that in, in the future. When it comes to ethnography, data collection is everything. And there are lots of different ways you can collect data. You can take screenshots. You can keep a, a rough journal of, of notes, descriptions of your experience and, and what's going on at the time. Journaling is probably the, the, the most common form of data collection when it comes to ethnography. You can record yourself. We're going to talk more about about ethnography as content in the future, but you know, large proportions of, of YouTube uh, vloggers are just ethnographers, right? They're just auto ethnographers. We'll talk more about that in the future as well. Photos, a great way um, to capture uh, experience. Uh, and then of course, screenshots uh, accompany with that. And then there's mapping. And when I talk about mapping, I'm not just talking about geographical mapping. I'm talking about conceptual mapping, ma mapping the relations between things uh, visually. Mind mapping, for example, is, is a common way of doing data collection with ethnography. So very important ethical limitations, uh, particularly at the moment for this subject. We are li limited in terms of the, the ethical boundaries and considerations that we have to do. I know, you know if you're a journalist uh, or you're working in the journalism major, there is, there is a different set of, of ethical considerations. And for now, just keep in mind that you do not have permission to reproduce the expressions or the representations of other people. So if you're doing a study of a community group on Facebook, that's awesome, but you cannot use screenshots of what other people are saying. You can describe it, however. You can describe your experience. And if you're participating, you can uh, reproduce your own ex expressions. So you can screenshot what you're saying and you can describe the responses, but you can't represent them. You can't show them directly and you can't reveal any personal information. So description of your experience is fine, but reproduction is not. So you have total permission to research your own experiences. And this is the this is the main thing. And we'll talk more about how this feeds into what's called autoethnography. So autobiographical ethnography in, in coming weeks. However, you do have permission to do research on and with each other. Or rather, you can give each other permission. Uh, because you're both or, or, or your group or whatever is inside the class. And so a collaborative approach to the subject is totally welcome. You won't be you'll be marked independently, but you can work collaboratively. Uh, and that's always encouraged in the subject. So let's talk a little bit more about the difference between methods and methodologies. A method is a procedure a way of conducting research. For example, interviews. One method of conducting interviews is called semi-structured. This is where you have a, 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 a list of questions and you are doing maybe half a dozen interviews and you're using the same basic set of questions to structure the, the interview with every participant. However, you might ask those questions differently and those questions might lead into sub-questions differently in each case. So it's structured, but it's only semi-structured because you're not limited to that. Whereas uh, an unstructured, in, unstructured interview is just a, you know, a long form chat discussion 
about a thing. And you might have a series of questions in mind, but you're not reading off and you're not going through those in, in a set way. So they're two different interview methods. A methodology is a broader category and it involves the method and the, the systematic way that you are performing your data collection. But it also involves what we would call an analytical framework and a theoretical or interpretive paradigm. Sometimes these two things overlap and become collapsed into the same thing. And sometimes they're separate and they have different stages. So think of think of method as the, the specific way in which you're collecting data and the methodology as the, the broader set of theories and perspectives and, pro- and processes for analysis and interpretation and you know, a summary of your findings, the much broader category. A methodology in quantitative or qualitative research changes and shapes the results through what we call a paradigm, right? A way of viewing the world. In ethnography, this is even more pronounced because the methodology is subjective and the researcher is the instrument for data collection, analysis, interpretation, and communication. Methodologies of quantitative research are often quite fast and cheap and reproducible, and you're using machines and computers and very objective measures of information Whereas qualitative research methodologies are often quite slow and therefore more expensive often. But but ethnography has value in terms of the types of data and the types of insights it can provide to businesses, companies, corporations, governments, institutions, and individual projects. Ethnography as a qualitative methodology will help you build communities of participants more than consumers and end users. And it will provide nuance and insight into information and experience that data and analytics can't. Ethnography will help you engage with participants as interested and invested collaborators and co-producers of knowledge and it will help you to generate creative, innovative, and specific responses to local, national, and broader global, cultural, environmental, social, and geographic problems and issues. So once, once we've collected our data, this is where the, the paradigm comes into effect. And it comes into effect in terms of how we analyze and interpret the data. Now, there are lots of different paradigms. We'll, we'll talk about some of them as we go through. And the readings um, address a lot of these in different ways. And I'm sure you'll have heard most of these terms. So I'm not, I'm not, even, I'm not even going to go into them. Um, just, to, just to kind of highlight the fact that, that these are the ways in which we can make sense of the text. Now, you don't have to use, um, say, uh, feminism on its own. You can pair um, uh, constructionism and indigenous theory with feminism to, pr- pr- to produce an analytical framework. This is, this is where you, ha- you build a kind of lens through which you pass your data And the important thing about a paradigm uh, or an analytical framework is that it structures the way you engage in the analysis of the data and it structures the the interpretation and the, and the, the, the information that comes out at the other end. And that's because these, these paradigms are systematic structures for making sense of things. They can be they can be really useful. Now you don't have you're not limited to these. You can you can design your own analytical framework. You can develop your own theories and ideas about the way of viewing the world. And, and I'm totally interested in that. You can also draw on the readings for the subject. 
uh, and start to build. So, for example, I don't have grounded theory there. Uh, and that's in in the readings. So you can bring in your own research and build your own analytical framework for examining the data that you collect. Once you've collected your data and you've started to analyze it, and then you've you've taken that analysis and you've started to interpret that through a particular paradigm or set of paradigms, then in the subject, you're going to communicate your results and you're going to communicate and mediate your results in order to convey your understanding to the audience that you're most interested in in talking uh, to. Now, this is this is really important because with ethnography, the, the results aren't generalizable. Right, so when you have a statistical analysis of something, you can generally you can say that this is that, that these results are generalizable. They can extrapolate to larger populations. For example, ethnography you can't do that. Ethnography when you are, when you are reporting on your findings, you are talking about the the experiences that you uh, observed in your instance of the research. I mean, if someone else came came to that same topic or that same interest and started to explore it, they would have totally different findings than what you would. And and that's not a weakness, that's a strength, right? That's because you are the instrument of the research, not, um, you know, not the algorithm. So you want to start to think about how you're going to communicate this, how you're going to communicate your experience. And it's important to remember that ethnography is methodologically narratively driven. That means it's about communicating stories of your experiences and other people's experiences with attention to the type of details that other methodologies would ignore. And you're going to explain and talk about them in ways that are totally impossible for quantitative approaches. So you might, you know, produce a, an, a, an audio essay, a video essay. You might be using social media. You might be creating um, uh, a website or some other form of technology. A phrase we'll talk a lot more in future um, about is, is thick description. And, and that's basically the idea that ethnography isn't just describing behavior. It's layering a series of observations and interpretations and attention to the broader cultural, technical, and social dimensions at work in the, situ in the situation. This makes ethnography not only useful as a form of research, but a great form of content. And I kind of want to leave you with this idea because once you start to see ethnography as content, you'll, you'll start to see it everywhere, whether it's in dramatic works, whether it's in comedy, you see, you know, in, ch check out any kind of comedy show on, on Netflix uh, or Amazon Prime, right? And, and you'll get these stories of people's experiences that are deliberately framed, right? And passed through para, uh, you know, a paradigm of comedic timing in order to create a specific, um, you know, interpretation for you that is, you know, humor or pathos or some kind of affect. But you'll see like almost all forms of comedy are forms of ethnography. Live streaming, vlogging, um, Twitch, Twitch TV, um, Facebook Live. Like these, these are pure ethnographic, almost unedited, raw, um, videographies of experience that's it for this video um, thank you for watching i look forward to uh, catching up with you in in the next video and uh, seeing you uh, on discord cheers bye